Man, we are continuing week two of our series, Unwrapped Gifts. And in this series is really all about us unwrapping the gift of love, joy, peace, and what we're talking about this morning, hope. And oftentimes in this season that we're, we're in right now, this Christmas season, we get so distracted, don't we? We get distracted by the gifts that we're going to give and the gifts we're going to receive, and we get busy running here and there, but we forget to unwrap the gifts that God has for us. The special gift of love, joy, peace, and hope. This season represents hope. Yeah? Let's read uh, our, our passage this morning. This is Luke 1, uh, 26 through 38. Let's unwrap the gift of hope this morning. It says this, Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. Remember that. The virgin's name was Mary, and having come in the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But then she said to him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. Would you say that wonderful name? Say Jesus. Jesus. Come a little louder. Jesus. Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Verse 36. Now indeed Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month of her who, has, who, who was called barren. Verse 37, I love this. For with God, nothing is impossible. Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. This announcement to Mary that she's going to bear the son of God. Her saying yes brought hope for all of humanity. Because of her yes, because of her obedience, it brought hope for you and for me. Let's pray this morning. Let's invite the Holy Spirit to speak through his word. Holy Spirit, I thank you for what you've already done in this place. I thank you, God, for those who just made a decision to walk through the gate. For, Lord, there is breakthrough in this place this morning. There is an anointing here for breakthrough, God. There, there is there's hope that we can cling on to because of your son, Jesus, who died on the cross for us, for the forgiveness of our sins, God. That, Lord, through that, God, we can, no matter what mountains we're facing, no matter what we're going through, no matter what trial, God, you are more than enough. And, God, you are our living hope. Hope has a name, and that name is Jesus. And so, Father, as we open up your word, I pray that today your Logos word would become Rhema, that God, it would be living and breathing and active in our hearts. God, we just want to speak and we want to say and we declare that God teaches your ways for we want to know you and find favor with you. God, we surrender to you this morning. Lord, we are your servants and we are listening. We love you so much. In Jesus' mighty name, everyone said amen. Amen. When I have the incredible privilege and the opportunity to pick up my kids from school, majority of the time my wife picks them up, but inevitably I'll ask my kids this question. I'll say, like any, any father or mother would ask, hey, how was your day today? And, you know, us hard degrees, we, we like to keep things pretty short and sweet and not go into too many details. And so Ruth and Caleb will, will immediately just say, good. It was good. Laura asked me how my day is going. Typically, I try to give her a little more than good, but I wanted to say it was good today. But immediately, what follows after 
it was good is my daughter asking this question. She always asks it in hope in her heart that we'll say yes. She says, Dad, will you take me to Sonic to get ice cream or Dairy Queen to get ice cream? And I look at my daughter in her face, and it's very difficult for me to, to say no, but I say no. Because I know it's not good to do that every single day. It's going to add up. It's going to be expensive, everything else, right? And I'll say no. But she has this glimmer of hope in her eye that I might say yes. Now, maybe it's only on a Friday. I might say yes. But she still, she has this hope every single day, almost every single day she asks, Dad, can we get ice cream? She has this hope that I'm going to say yes because there's times where I do say yes. But I've never heard her ask for something that wasn't good before. Like she's never said, hey, Dad, can we go to the sushi restaurant and go eat some uh, raw octopus? Like uh, I can, it's the most disgusting thing I can think of right now. She doesn't ask that question. No, when she say, Dad, can we get ice cream? Because she has this hope in her heart that I'll say yes. None of us hope for anything bad, do we? We don't want anything hard to happen to us, difficult. We don't want any challenges. We, we, don't, we don't hope for our car to break down on the Buckman Bridge in the middle of rush hour traffic, do we? That happened this past week to one of our staff members, Scott. We don't, we don't hope for uh, something bad to eat. No, we only want something good. Like we want every single meal of man is, I hope it tastes good, right? You don't hope it tastes bad. You don't hope and say, man, I hope I get fired today. I hope my boss is mean to me today. No, we, what do we say? We say, man, I, I hope that today is a really great day. I hope that that Mexico trip that I've saved and I've already bought uh, in the summertime, I hope there's good weather and there's not a hurricane coming through, right? It happened to a friend of mine, Pastor Joey, uh, this, this past time he went to Mexico, like he, uh, he encountered bad weather. You don't hope for bad weather when you do something like that. You, don't, you only say, man, I hope that everything turns out. I hope I get a raise. I hope for something good to happen. And God has placed a desire inside of each and every one of us uh, to hope. And that hope should lead us to, uh, to the Father, he has given us this hope inside of our hearts because we were made in his image and this hope should be directed towards him, should draw us towards him. Let me give you the definition of hope this morning. It's this, hope is a confident expectation and desire for something good in the future. Hope is a confident, say confident. One more time, y'all, say confident. It's a confident expectation and desire for something good in the future. Not something bad, but something good. In our work, in our families, in our own personal lives, I believe what often happens is we, we deal with so much broken hope. We put our hope in something and think it's going to work out. And, man, I, I hope this is going to happen. I hope this is going to be really good. But what ends up happening doesn't happen the way that we thought it was going to happen. And then we lose all hope in our life. But like I said before, we cannot lose hope because we serve a God of hope. We serve a God of the impossible. He makes what's impossible become possible and we can have hope and that hope directs us to the Lord. Here's the best way to say it. The Christmas story reminds us that hope will never be found when you look vertically. It will only be found when you look vertically up to heaven up to Jesus, our God. You know, it's not enough to say that God gives us hope, but what the Christmas story declares to us is that God is hope. He is hope. The truth is that hope is not a thing, but it's a person. And that person is Jesus. That person is Emmanuel, God with us. One of my favorite scriptures in all the Bible Romans 15, 13, may the God of hope, he's a God of hope, may the God of hope, what, fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow, man, we should be Christians, we should be people who overflow with hope, are you overflowing with hope this morning, overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, as you take a closer look at Scripture and you see hope being mentioned, you can see that hope is in direct correlation with God. Every time it comes up, it's in direct correlation with God. 
But it takes us saying yes to God to have hope. We say yes even though what's in front of us is difficult. We say yes through the challenges of life. We say yes even when we don't understand y'all. When you don't understand, can you still say yes to the Lord? When he's leading you and asking you to do something, will you say yes? Think about Mary for a moment. She gets this, this angel literally shows up to her. You, I mean, I would just be flabbergasted in that moment. This angel shows up and declares to her, hey, I know you haven't been with a man before, but you're going to have a son. She's like, wait, I, I, I'm going to be married to Joseph. What is Joseph going to be thinking, right? Like, uh, I, I don't know about this. Like, uh, this doesn't seem, like, what are people going to think about me if, I, if, if this happens, right? But what does she say? Even though she doesn't understand, even though she's worried about what people are going to think, including her fiance, what does she say? I'm your servant. God, I'm your servant. Be it unto me according to your word. She says yes to God despite not understanding, despite the challenges that might come, despite the challenges that, that, that she might be facing. She says yes to God. Can we just say yes to the Lord right now? Come on, just say yes to the Lord. Lord, we say yes to you. We say yes to your will in our life. We say yes to your way. We say yes to you this morning, Jesus. Lord, we are your servants. God, we are listening. And God, we declare yes. Just as Mary declared, let it be unto me according to your word. Lord, we declare the same thing. You see, Mary's response gives us hope for all believers that by saying yes to God, we participate in this incredible story that Christmas represents. Jesus is our hope. When we say yes to God and put our trust in him, God literally fills us with hope. Some of you all need hope in this place. God is your hope. He is your salvation. He is your very present help in time of need. Let me give you three things this morning when talking about hope. Three things on how he is our only hope. Number one, I'm sure we can make this list much stronger, much larger than this, but here's the three things I came up with. Number one, our only hope for salvation is who? Our only hope for salvation is Jesus. It's Jesus. When I was uh, 22 and I was at my first uh, ministry job, uh, we had... Uh, different pastors who were on call each day for anyone who came to the church and, and walked in. And uh, there was a man who showed up. His name was Hakeem one, one day. And I was on call that day, so I got to minister to him, had the privilege to do so. And so he shows up and uh, he starts asking me questions just about the Lord. He came out of desperation because of just a, a, a need in his life, a physical need in his life. And uh, He's Muslim, but he's battling this inside of his soul. Like he's battling, like who is the one true God? He wants to talk about it. So, him and I developed this friendship, and we get together once a week for about six to eight weeks, and just talking about the Lord and uh, talking about Allah, His God, and I'm talking about Jesus, the one true living God. And we're having this conversation, and then finally, the Holy Spirit just broke through. But notice one thing, it took me kind of building a relationship with him before it really kind of broke through in his life. I spent time with him over over weeks. So I'm having this conversation with him. The Holy Spirit kind of comes into it and breaks through. And he says with tears in his eyes, he says, I want to give my life to Jesus. I've got to give my life to Jesus. But he says this, he says, it's been very hard for me because it's as if I'm condemning my mother and father to hell. Because if I make this choice, I'm saying that God is the one true God, that, that Jesus is the one true God and not, not Allah. And it's, it, it's really difficult for me to make this decision. He says, but I've got hope that they're going to be led to Jesus one day, but I've got to give my life to Jesus. 
I've got to give my life to Jesus. I have this hope that is burning inside of me that my family is going to be saved, but I know that I have to, I have to get right with the Lord. You see, Jesus is your only hope for salvation. It's not going to be any other God. It's not going to be money. It's not going to be a parent's relationship. It's not going to be a family member. It's not going to be anything else. You see, Jesus, he is our only hope for salvation. It is him and him alone. He has paid the price on Calvary. It is only when we surrender our life to him that we can find hope. John 14, 6 says this, Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The Christmas story clearly shows that the only hope for salvation is the person, and that person is Jesus. Think about what the baby Jesus represents. The baby Jesus represents hope. He hadn't lived the perfect life yet. He hadn't gone to the the cross yet. Yet the Magi came offering gifts to hope. Yet the shepherds came to worship hope. Jesus, he was laid in the manger and he represented hope. Mary wandered in her heart and that wandering was this hope that she had in her heart. Jesus is our living hope. He is the only one we can put hope in. Hope was a baby and his name was Jesus. And this baby lived a blameless life, a perfect life, so we would have life. The only solution, y'all, was a savior. And the only suitable savior was the wisdom and the power and the righteousness to accomplish the task would be God himself. You see, the one denied would come to rescue his deniers. The one rejected would move to save his rejectors. The one who had been rebelled against, against countless times would come to redeem his rebels. He would not come to set up an earthly kingdom, y'all, and enforce his own rule on us unwillingly. But what did he do? He would not come to judge and condemn. He would not come demanding everyone's service. He gives us free will. No, he came to serve and to suffer and to die so that his kingdom would reign in the hearts of his people. He came to seek and to save. He came to suffer and to forgive. He came to rescue and to restore. He came to call and draw and love those who without grace would continue to live for themselves. He came. Jesus came. And because he did, there is hope that sinners like me And sinners like you might be redeemed through his blood and through his sacrifice in this world would be renewed. It really is true that our only hope for salvation is in the name of Jesus. And Jesus, through his death on the cross, is our salvation and our hope for all. He is our living hope. Hope has a name and his name is Jesus. Can you just give God some praise right now for the hope that we have in Jesus? He is our salvation. Thank you, Jesus. We are all sinners, including myself, and Jesus saved us through what he did on the cross. Not only does this hope save you from hell, though, but he saves you from your problems. Number two this morning, our only hope for our problems is Jesus. Our only hope for our problems is Jesus. Hebrews 7.25. Therefore, he is able to save completely. He is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Think about that for a moment. Jesus, the Son of God, is literally interceding and praying for us. Jesus is praying for you. Just think about that for a moment. Like really let that settle in. Jesus, the Son of God, is praying for you. Would you turn to your neighbor right now and say, Jesus is praying for you. Now turn to your other neighbor you may not like as much, just joking, and say, That's really good because you got some problems. (laughs) 
Don't we all face problems in our life? Y'all, every single one of us got some problems. Thank God for Jesus. Thank God for our Savior, Jesus. We've got problems. We are messed up. We are torn up. There is no perfect person. There's no perfect pastor. There's no perfect friend. But we've got some problems. But our Savior, Jesus, is more than enough. He is more than enough for any trial, any challenge, anything you're facing. God is enough. You know, just because you put your hope in Jesus does not mean the storm instantly stops. It doesn't. That storm could keep going on and on and on, but it doesn't mean that you can't have hope in the middle of the storm. You can't have strength in the middle of the storm. David writes this. He says this. I love this. Psalm 31, 24. Be strong. Tell that same neighbor you told them they have problems. Say, say, be strong in your problems. Say, be strong. Be strong and take heart, all you who hope in the Lord. Even after making a choice to put your hope in Jesus, you still have to be strong. You still got to be strong in the middle of your problems. How do we find strength in the chaos of our challenges and our problems? What do we do? We stand on the word. We stand on the word of God. The word of God is the love letter to us, his people. When we're going through challenges, we're going through trials, when we feel like, man, it's just too much and those problems are are coming up because we all got them, what do we do? We go to the Word of God. That's why it's so important to spend time with the Lord every single day, reading your Word. You've got to love the Word. You've got to love the Word, and as you love the Word, those problems that you have in your life don't seem so big. Psalm 33, 18, 22. This is encouraging. You stand on passages like this when you're going through something. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love, to deliver them from death and to keep them alive in famine. We wait in hope for the Lord. In the middle of the trial, in the middle of the problem, in the middle of the challenge, you can wait in hope for the Lord, for he is our help our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. You see how just standing on the word of God, it gives you so much hope. When you're going through something, man, you just, Lord, give, give give me a scripture right now. Lord, 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 give me something. Give, give, me, give me a word right now. And what do you do? You take that word, you memorize it, you hide it in your heart, and then what happens? You read it every single day. You remind yourself of that word that God gave you, and you read it over and over. And what happens? Your perspective changes, your mind changes, and that problem which seems so big at one point, pff, it's nothing. Because you're refining your perspective through the word of God. So we can have hope through our problems. What happens in the middle of our problems is God turns the chaos, turns the problems into victory. Number three, our only hope for victory is Jesus. Our only hope for victory is Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15, 57, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He Notice, it's he who gives us the victory. Not us, but him. You know, my my favorite uh, character in all the Bible is the story of David, other than Jesus, of course. But David, he, he was such a man after the presence of God. It literally says that David was a man after God's own heart. He wrote things like, hey, as the deer pants for the water, God, so my soul pants after you. He writes things like, one of my favorite scriptures in all the Bible is one thing I ask, this one thing I desire, that will I seek after, that I'll, that, that I'll um, this one thing I ask, this alone I seek, that I'll, uh, I'm forgetting it right now, it's standing, I'm forgetting, it doesn't matter. <laughs> the one thing I ask, this alone I seek, that I'll be in the presence of God, y'all. 
Mind blank. It happens. It's still my favorite, though. Trust me. But he writes things that are just so like, I'm after the presence of the Lord. I've got to have his presence. It came from a desire, a place, Lord, I've just got to have you. I've got to be with you. He had such a desire for his presence that he wanted to build a house for God for his presence. But what God said to him is, you know what, I'm not, I'm not gonna, you're not going to build a house for my presence, but I'm going to use your house as a lineage for my son. Listen to, to what happens here. The, the, that the Messiah would come through his lineage. Luke 132, he will be great and will be called the son of the, of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. 2 Timothy 2.8, remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Isaiah 9, 6 through 7, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of, his, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and justice. You see how David comes up when is establishing God's kingdom, because of his heart after God? What was the key to David's success? His heart after God. And so 2 Samuel 8, 6, it says this, so the Lord gave David victory wherever he went. The key to David's victory, you know, Israel was the most successful at the time of, of, of King David's reign. Why? Because he had a heart after God. He had a heart after God. It wasn't his military strength that solidified the victories that he got. It wasn't his leadership abilities. It, he, he wasn't following the 10 easy steps to winning military wars. No, it was a heart after God. It was simply the God of hope in his life that gave him the victory. The Lord blessed him. The Lord protected him. The Lord prospered him and gave him the victory. David wrote this in Psalms. Psalms 5, 11 through 12, but let all those rejoice who put their trust in you. Let them ever shout for joy because you defend them. Let those also who love your name be joyful in you. For you, O Lord, will bless the righteous with favor. You will surround him as with a shield. Psalms 144, 1 through 2, blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hand for war, and my fingers for battle, my loving kindness in my fortress my high tower and my deliverer, my shield and the one in whom I take refuge. He subdues my people under me. You see, this is the place of victory in our lives. It's not because we fight for victory. It's something we receive through faith. He does the work for us and un in us and through us by the Holy Spirit, by faith in Jesus. By faith in Jesus, you can overcome sin. You can overcome darkness. You can overcome death. Think of that, victory over sin. You can have victory over sin and walk in righteousness because of Jesus. You are an overcomer. You have to know because of what Jesus did for you, you are an overcomer. Romans 8, 37, it all, these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. 2 Corinthians 2.14, now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. 1 Corinthians 15.57, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We don't get victory by fighting with our fists, by throwing punches. What do we do? We get victory through surrender. We get victory through worship. We get victory through prayer, through seeking Jesus. No matter what problem you're facing, our God is more than enough. And as you draw near to him, he'll draw near to you, and he'll give you the victory you need in your life. Not always the way that you want it, though, but he'll lead you and guide you through those circumstances. He'll use those moments and those challenging times to give you hope to shape you into the character, to shape your character, to mold you and to shape you into the person he wants you to be so you can be effective for God's kingdom. Would you rise with me all over this room?